cutie. <laughs> I'm assuming if I can see you, you can see me. Are you M O P S I K? Never mind. Okay, I think we're I think we're good to go now. So it is seven o'clock, and I'm going to start the show. Okay. Well, welcome everyone uh, to this, the sixth event in the series that we have, the Appalachian Heritage Writer in Residence and the 2020 West Virginia Common Read author, Dorothy Allison. The title of the series is The Power of the Story and Writing for One's Life. And I think we're gonna be in for a treat tonight. Um, first of all, though, I want to introduce someone really, really special. We're delighted to have him here. And I wanna say this in terms of preface uh, before I get to that introduction that let me just read for you the name, the roll call of the writers that have been in this series. So this has been going for about 20 years. I know that it's time for me to retire. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we'll start with George Ella Lyon. She is the current Poet Laureate of uh, Kentucky. Denise Jardino, Robert Morgan, Fred Chapel, Jane Ann Phillips, Terry Kay, Henry Louis Gates, Adriana Trigiani, Silas House, Bobby Ann Mason, Ron Rash, Gretchen Moran Laskus, Frank X. Walker, Homer Hickam, Nikki Giovanni, Charles Frazier, Wiley Cash, Karen Spears, Zacharias, Crystal Wilkinson last year, and this year a really, really special writer that we'll introduce in just a moment. But the group, the entity that makes all of this possible from the very beginning of this series to right now is the West Virginia Humanities Council. And I will tell you, when we started this 20 years ago, we did not have these things that I think do benefit the state wonderfully well. This program has made possible the Anthology of Appalachian Writers, the West Virginia Fiction Competition, the Celtic Roots Global Appalachia Program, four NEH summer institutes for teachers called Voices from the Misty Mountains. And it was after we started this program that we got a minor and a graduate certificate and an MA. So honestly, we owe it all because none of it would have happened without these writers because these writers have such a draw, such a, such a pool. Uh, sometimes wonder why do they come to Shepherd University and to West Virginia, but they come because they know that we appreciate them immensely and we do an awful lot of work for them and they make us better for their having come here. So that then leads into my introduction of Dr. Eric Wagner. He's the executive director of the West Virginia Humanities Council. Uh, he was born in Malden, West Virginia. He is a graduate of West Virginia Wesleyan, where he got his BA and then his MA from Old Dominion University and his PhD from Arizona State University. Before moving to West Virginia Humanities Council in 2018, he was Associate Professor of American Literature and Cultural Studies at West Virginia Wesleyan, where he chaired the English department and then served as director of the School of Fine Arts and Humanities. He has over 20 years of a writing career in creative nonfiction, literary criticism, music and film journalism, and all of these have appeared in a whole range of publications. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Eric Wagner, who's going to say a few words about the West Virginia Humanities Council. So, Eric. Thanks, Sylvia. And hello to everyone. We are delighted to join you here, even in challenging times. The work goes on, as we know. Um, at the West Virginia Humanities Council, we are the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And in that capacity, we're fortunate every year to help fund over 400 programs on average around the state through direct programs and grants. And every now and then we're privileged to work with a program that sings way above what you would think its range would be. And the Appalachian Heritage Writer in Residence program is certainly one that is, uh, that Sylvia gives us too much credit. Uh, the real work goes on with the very small dedicated staff, passionate staff that administer this program. It's a program that would not exist without the generosity and sacrifice of those people on the ground and certainly the generosity of the writers who are involved. Um, we are overjoyed 
to join this year for Dorothy Allison. As I was telling Sylvia a little bit to begin with the geek out moment, this is a moment that is one of the highlights of my personal and professional life. I've been such a fan of Dorothy Allison's work ever since I read Bastard Out of Carolina. You don't need me to run down the names. If you're joining us, undoubtedly you already know. Um, I have since then, I think, read everything of Miss Allison's that I could get my hands on. Um, <laughs> she is a writer I so very much admire for her passionate work in advocacy, uh, in freedom of the press, and in enfranchisement and equality across the board. Um, for all those reasons and so many more. We're so happy to be involved in this. We feel it is a, a great privilege for the council and uh, I'll get out of the way. I'm looking forward to tonight's content as much as anyone else. I'm jumping at the bit to just be a spectator. So Sylvia, thanks so much. And Miss Allison, thank you so much for joining us for this program. Uh, we're delighted. Thanks, Sylvia. Back to you. Absolutely. Thank you very much for those words. And, and honestly, I think that is a fitting and wonderful introduction I, I, of Dorothy. I just told Dorothy, that I was not going to go through that long introduction that I did today, because after all, this program is called The Writer's Life. And so without any further ado, and with, I think, Eric's wonderful words about Dorothy Allison, let us introduce and turn this program over to Dorothy Allison talking about The Writer's Life. And when she finishes, if we have time, we may be able to have questions and you should use your chat room to put those questions in. And you can go ahead as things, ideas come to you and you want to put something in the chat room, please do that. But let me turn it over now to a wonderful writer, an authentic uh, person and a generous person, Dorothy Allison. <laughs> I am authentic as sin, <laughs> <laughs> which I've always felt was authentic. <laughs> oh. It's, I couldn't sleep last night, um, although things are, we are in much better shape here for the moment. You don't want to, you don't want to tempt the Lord. Um, as I told, as I mentioned this morning, we've been evacuated twice in the last two weeks because of fire swooping pretty close. Um, the fire did not jump the river. And then My, I can't do this in my office at the moment because my office is still full of bags of notebooks and books and papers, um, all the stuff that we threw in the car and the truck getting ready to run. The funny thing is, is while that was all going on, I found myself thinking about the sweep of my life. And I can remember being a very small child, five or six years old, and being in one of those situations where everything gets tossed in the truck and you run. I think that that particular running took place when, um, as sometimes happened, my parents had not been able to make the rent and we were running ahead of bill collectors. <laughs> I don't know if you can understand me, you're leaning forward, so maybe not. But this might be something that is familiar to you if you grew up poor in the South, which is that you're not bad people and you do pay your rent and you do pay your bills. It's just that you don't always pay them on time. And sometimes the bill collectors have no patience. I remember that trip because my uncle showed up and they emptied the house into two trucks and a Chevy, old Chevy, and we took off. I wasn't sure where we'd wind up. And we wound up in this tiny little house where the only heat was a fire grate in each bedroom. And my mother put us in the bedroom, built up the fire in the grate, and then went out to haul in her dishes. When I was packing up for us to run, I didn't pack any dishes. I packed books. I packed notebooks. I packed boxes of letters. The ephemera of a writer's life. I'm 71 years old. I've been telling stories since I was six years old when I became the de facto babysitter, because somehow among all my cousins at six, I was more reliable than some of the eight and 10 year olds. And I would be put to watching over the, young, the younger and sometimes the older cousins. I remember how difficult it was to keep them from, well, let's be clear, from hitting each other in the head with objects they should not have used on dogs, much less people. And I remember that there was only one thing that worked. I had to tell them a story. 
Now, when you are telling stories to small children with violent tendencies, you will tell stories that will catch their attention. So there must be violent tendencies. There must be wild dogs. There must be running horses. There must be free rolling pickup trucks coming off the road and into the ditches. There must be people screaming and shouting. There must be blood on the leaves and fire in the trees. My mother, my aunts, and I all discovered that I had a gift for that. I could scare hell out of a passel of youngsters, get them all to sit open-mouthed looking up at me as I made up stories about them, my cousins, my uncles, not my mama. I never, I never made up stories about my mama, but now and again, I would touch on my aunts. I should tell you, my grandmother had 11 children, six girls, five boys. My Aunt Dot matched her, 11 children, six girls, five boys, two sets of twins. My mother was considered pitiful because she only gave birth to two girls. Adopted a little boy briefly, but then they took him away from us. When you have that family connection, that breadth, that, well, I don't have to explain it to you, do I? You're in West Virginia. Many of you are scholarship children. Many of you have extended family. You know what I'm talking about. You know how hard it is just to care for, feed, clothe, and encourage small armies of young people, small armies of children, and sometimes how to keep them in control. I discovered that telling a story, telling a scary story, sometimes throwing in one of the real uncles or touching on some actual event that they had heard people talk about if they hadn't seen it themselves, that that would catch their attention and hold them. It is from that that I date my life as a writer. And it is true that by the time I was eight, I was writing stories, little stories, short stories, in notebooks, in scraps of paper, but I was burning everything I wrote. I was terrified that if anybody read what I was writing, they would know too much about me. Not just that we were poor, not just that I was teaching myself how to cuss, but that I had been raped and was being raped and that I could not figure out how to escape it. My life was secret. I once read a science fiction short story in which the people in this future world were told how to develop a genius child, how to actually create genius in a child. And the entire technique appeared to be to terrify the child, to abuse the child just enough that the child would have reason to be smart, dedicated and hardworking. I was living that science fiction story as a child, but I couldn't tell anyone. I couldn't tell my mother, it would have broken her heart. I couldn't tell my uncles, they would have beaten my stepfather to death and gone to prison. I couldn't tell my aunts, they would have poisoned him and achieved the same purpose. It seemed to me that while I was weak and not as good as I should be, the world was huge and dangerous and I was most dangerous to the people I loved. I became extremely clever at hiding, running away, and disappearing. How is that the making of a writer's life? You probably know. Writers are watchers. Writers are note takers. Writers are secret keepers and sometimes secret tellers. Writers are those children at school who don't answer up the first time who cut their eyes at you, look away, don't answer questions directly, carry a notebook, hide in the woods, sometimes walk miles and miles talking out loud, which was the primary exercise I got as a child. I could literally do five, six miles at a walk all the time talking aloud and flinging my arms in the air, voicing the people I was making up or sometimes voicing the people I knew that briefly I would inhabit. That's story making and story making 
is not quite writing. In school, and I went to school first in South Carolina, <laughs> which, um, do you know the motto of the South Carolina school system? I don't know that West Virginia has to worry about this, but the motto of the South, Car South Carolina school system was, thank God for Mississippi. Because on a ranking of schools in the United States, Mississippi was dead last and South Carolina was next to last. It's hard, hard to realize that the best education you can get is not very good. But the best education I got was the fact that I learned to read so young that my mother discovered I could read when I was four years old, when I started reading the funny papers out loud to my sisters. It was that gift, that being able to read, and I read everything, including my mama's mysteries, and occasionally some of the pornography my stepfather kept under his bed, most of which I didn't understand, which is just as well. But everything, everything, I would stand in the grocery store and read labels on boxes. I'd read recipes that my aunt in her old cookbook. I'd read the newspapers. I'd read the funny papers. I'd read anything. The books they gave me at school, well, let's just say, especially South Carolina, fairly pitiful, fairly pitiful. But occasionally anthologies, occasionally a short story that echoed some piece of something I understood and knew you make a writer in some ways by making writing the place you go to for vindication, for purpose, for meaning, but oh, most importantly, for control, for saying how it turns out, for making people on the page, your people, written with love, written with understanding. When I was in the fifth grade, I got a teacher, I still remember. I remember that she was gray-headed, skinny, and mean. Very firm, very stern. You will sit down, you will listen to me. You will do what I tell you, I'm saving your life. I still remember her standing up there, pushing her hair out of her face. She had short curls that creep forward. And her saying, I'm saving your life. I'm giving you a tool you'll use forever. And then giving us anthologies, and sometimes, sometimes getting us to write our own stories, sometimes persuading us to stand up and read them out loud to each other. Fifth grade, she was a marvel. And she kept telling me, you got stuff. That expression, you got stuff, South Carolina. You got stuff, girl. And then we went off to Florida. Florida had a better school system, better schools, better books, better library. My stepfather got a new job. My mama wound up working at a diner not too far away, so she was home more. But we were living in a little subdivision next to the Frito-Lay plant. I was going crazy. I had found ways mostly to avoid my stepfather. I had reached the point though where I was trying to keep my younger sisters with me and out of the house. I became calculated. Along about that time, they did these tests. I don't know if you still do them, where they do your IQ test. I knew that the idea was they would give you an IQ test and then they would assign you to a particular track in school. You wanted to get in the track that would put you into college, but the child of a truck driver and a waitress doesn't get to think that much about college. But I scored the highest score in this class the teacher called my mama to tell her. My mama looked at me, got a jar, put it on her dresser, and said, my girl's going to college. <laughs> a woman who had dropped out of school in the seventh grade was going to send her girl to college. And I believed her. I absolutely believed her. Years later, when it came time to go to college, that jar was still sitting on her dresser and it didn't have much more than a stack of quarters. She'd been putting in it for years and pulling out. But I took every test God made. I won a National Merit Scholarship. 
I won a scholarship not only from the Baptist church, but from the Mormon church, which I had started attending on the sly because I thought maybe they knew something. I had enough money to go away to school. I felt rich. I felt powerful. I went to Florida Presbyterian College. I had scholarships to go to New York or Massachusetts. But the reality was I didn't own a winter coat and I couldn't figure out how you go north without a winter coat. In St. Petersburg, Florida and the Florida Presbyterian was an experimental school. They were very clear about how experimental and progressive they were. And I thought, okay, that sounds good. I'll go there. And they were delighted to get me. Let me just say children, a national merit scholarship is a good thing. It means that almost any school will take you because they get matching money, I believe, although I'm not too sure about how any of that works anymore. But they took me in, they gave me cash, they sent me to St. Petersburg, Florida, and I went to college. I had not realized what a small independent college would be like. I hadn't realized that it would not be full of scholarship students the way it would have been if I'd gone to Michigan or New York. That in fact, I would, I would be the resident freak. I would be still the child of a truck driver and a waitress. And I would still be telling lies and telling stories. There's a thing about telling story, making story, making up a story, making up a story you will tell other people, sometimes to scare them like you do with the little children, sometimes to awe them like you do with girlfriends or people you're flirting with, sometimes, sometimes, just, sometimes just for yourself to say, this is who we are. This is who we are that the world does not know who we are. This is my counter to all the stories we are told about who we are. That is the birth of the real writing life. It's called defending your people. But the reality is not so much defending as creating. In my own mind, I was trying to figure out who we were. Having run away from South Carolina and my mama's people, living alone in my stepfather's house in Central Florida, winning scholarships, going to a small private college, not having the right clothes, but God made thrift stores and I can work as a waitress and pick up cash. I felt myself a freak. Even before I realized that I was a freak, I was a lesbian and just to say, first thing you better do is keep that quiet when you're living in Central Florida <laughs> in 1971. I kept that quiet. I wasn't that good at it anyway. I was scared. I was angry. I wrote scared, angry stories. I showed them to no one. And I continued what I had begun when I was eight, and nine, burning every story I wrote or shoving them down under the coffee grounds in the garbage, being too afraid that people would know what I was thinking, the stories in my head, the life I was making up on the page. I wrote revenge stories. I wrote glory stories. Wasn't much given to sex stories. I wrote all the things I could imagine. I imagined my uncles were all Robert Mitchum in them movies and they were driving the back roads and they were selling moonshine, which of course was not true. They were drinking moonshine, but not selling it. They were furnace workers and roofers. One day I wrote a true story I have to tell you that one of the ways that my uncles made do was that every summer, <laughs> especially more properly late fall, they would go roofing. Now, when my uncles went roofing, <laughs> they went roofing and pick up trucks full of buckets of tar and they would cut a deal with the homeowner. Ah, we'll get you a new roof on there in no time. And they would. They'd climb up on that roof and they'd spread tar from one end to the other, which is just fine in the fall and winter. Come spring and summer when the heat comes in, that tar would melt off and run down. But by then my uncles were long gone somewhere else, the money already spent. When it realized that what they were doing was in fact a swindle, that what they were doing was criminal I refused to be ashamed. 
I wrote a story in which even ripping off old ladies and church going Christian people was somehow an act of revenge for the poverty and misery of their lives. You're not always right when you write a story. You don't always understand, but I loved my uncles. I made them heroic. It took me years and years to read those stories again, the few I had kept and realized, I think you're missing the point, girl. I had to work myself around to the point. The writing life, you think, putting it on the page, that you are creating something revelatory and strong, and you may be creating something revelatory and strong, but your slant of vision, the way you put it, the things you understand and value, they will shape the story you can tell, and you can be dead wrong about a lot of things. You can fall in love with dangerous people and make them heroic on the page. You can love your uncle so much, you can justify them ripping off old ladies and leaving them with a roof that'll melt down the sides of their house. The writing life is a long, slow self-examination. It is a long, slow revelation. My writing life was shaped by the accident of the day in which I was born, the age into which I was born. Having been born in 1949, I went to college in 1971. Now, let's see, 69. I graduated in 71. Unfortunately, I did get a scholarship to go to graduate school. And once again, all the places that I was offered graduate work were up north. Yet again, I didn't have a coat. I took a year working waitress to earn enough money to think about it and nearly lost my mind. It's one thing to be a girl and take a summer job that you're gonna work for the summer to earn money to go to college in the fall. It is another thing to have graduated from college, step out into the world and wind up once again working waitress or as I did for a while, a nanny a housekeeper, a mop racker. I'm sure you don't know what a mop racker does, but let me just say, it's a terrible job, <laughs> a terrible job. <laughs> I used to stretch fabric over metal frames. And the whole idea was to put the fabric on these frames. People would then attach poles and they could mop big factory floors and linoleum. The problem was of course, that the fabric was soaked in this material that would clean floors it would also take the skin off your fingers. After a few weeks, I didn't have any skin on my fingers and my mother discovered my hands were raw and bleeding and she was like, oh Lord child, you're getting another job. The work that you find, the jobs that you undertake, they become backstory. They become the way in which you understand the world. I could not make a story out of mop racking. I was ashamed of being a mop racker, me with my Bachelor of Arts and what was I gonna do? I fell into the women's movement the way a drunkard throws himself into the river. I was in Tallahassee, Florida. I had gotten a job finally working for the Social Security Administration. I was a GS5, which never pays enough money, especially not when they want you to wear very nice clothes in the office. I had two suits. I alternated them until somebody mentioned that I was might want to think about getting another suit. <laughs> God save me. I was working for SSI. I don't know if you know what that is, but it meant that the Social Security Administration was put in charge of administering the welfare system for the state of Florida. And that meant that people in desperate situations would come into the Social Security office, women with four or five children in hand, men with hats in their hands, couples, old couples with their faces just raw, raw, desperate and ashamed because they had to ask for help. And I had to sit there and tell them they could not get help. So to talk to you about the writing life, let me tell you about my life of crime. Because while working for the Social Security Administration, I would go in at night and type up and print that's right, on a mimeograph machine. You don't even know what that is. Ask your grandma, she'll tell you. And then 
staple together little pamphlets that I created. It was a pamphlet titled, How to Get What You Need. And it essentially listed the questions that the SSI people at Social Security would ask you and how you should answer them. Because some of those questions, even I, even then, knew that they were tricks. And the trick was you had to wash them out. You had to send them away. You had to disallow them. And the trick was, well, they had to have private access to cabinets to keep their food. They had to have, it was a long list of things they had to have. My little pamphlet listed all the things you had to say you had. Let me just say, my life of crime was re recognizing that I was committing a criminal act. I was providing information to people who needed help, who otherwise would not get it. It was not technically illegal, I suppose, although I know that if they had discovered that I was producing these pamphlets, I would have been in a lot of trouble and I would have surely lost my job. But I also know that there were women with four and five children sitting in front of me desperate with that pamphlet in their hands, going down the list, answering those questions, getting benefits, pitiful amounts of money just to keep them alive. That was my first real effective writing. I am not ashamed. And these days I'm 71, what are they gonna do? Hunt me down and put me in jail for having written pamphlets when I was, 22, writing that, writing that pamphlet, writing the stories I was writing at night, trying to imagine how it was that writers actually did it. I became a writer without knowing that I was a writer. I volunteered at a little magazine in Tallahassee. I think it was called Amazing Grace. It was amazing that we ever got an issue out. We published bad poetry. We published pitiful short stories. We published passionate essays about the injustice of the world. I loved it. I wasn't any good. I couldn't write for, I could not write very well. But I was learning. I was getting better. I wrote a bad poem. My magazine published it. <laughs> it was a terrible poem. I think the title was Lo, Our Lady of the Mad Madonna. Now with that title, you know it was a terrible poem. And I wrote terrible short stories about little girls that acquired shotguns, little boys that ran away with their little sisters in their arms, mothers who drove away in the night in old Chevys the way my mother had done one night in South Carolina. All those stories, all those stories. And then I burned them ritually, carefully, afraid somebody would read them and find out what I was thinking. I worked as a feminist editor at Amazing Grace. I was invited to move to Washington DC and worked on a magazine called Quest, a feminist journal. I was invited to co-teach at George Washington University with uh, Charlotte Munch, a class in feminist political theory. All that time I was slowly teaching myself to be a better writer. If you read about writers, especially what I think of as the, the breakout stars in writing, one of the things that they will tell you is that they give you this magical impression of how they became writers, the genius that cropped out, the glory that was their first story, the glory that was their second story, how straightforward it was, how they gradually acquired skill, how they began to share their stories and everybody loved them and it was encouraging. Those stories, those fantasies, and they were fantasies, did not seem to be working for me. For me, writing was painful and scary and, and I was telling secrets. I could not tell the essential secret, of course. I could not ever write about having been raped at five. I could not put that on the page because then I would have been that girl who was raped at five. And I did not know how to be that in the world and stay sane. It was the women's movement that gave me a way to be sane and be matter of fact, to walk into a support group for rape survivors, sit down and say, the first time I was five, and have people look back at me, not with expressions of horror or disgust, but some of them nodding with understanding. 
my life as a writer has been shaped by the fact that I was raped at five. And that is a terrible thing to say. I suspect that I would have been a writer if I had not happened, if I had had the grace to have been born into a middle-class family in a urban city, to have gone to an exclusive school. I have that love for language that is inherent in some of us. But then again, I could have taken writing country Western music. Uh, I think a lot of uh, you understand what that is like. You can write terrible, terrible stories in country Western songs. <laughs> You got a good chorus, you can carry it forward. But I became a writer and built a writing life in resistance to my own self-hatred, shame, and fear. And it was the women's movement that told me I had reason, that I had purpose, that my life had meaning. It wasn't so simple as the Baptists had told me. God wasn't going to step in and strike my stepfather dead. He lived long and he made my mama's life miserable. He scared hell out of my two younger sisters and he terrorized them until they both left home early. He was a broken man and he broke other people. I had to get old enough to write Cave Dweller before I began to see in Clint some sympathy for broken men, to begin to see what had broken them and to learn how it was my stepfather was broken. But that's another story. You build the writing life out of the bricks you need to do something of worth. And when I started writing stories that took my own breath away, I said, damn, all right. That's what it was like. That's how it works. To use simile and mystery and language and let your mama speak on the page, say things she said to you, let your Aunt Dot talk on the page, not as her, but as somebody you made up a little bit like her to give a woman eight children and put her in a small frame house in the countryside and write of the glory of walking out on the porch with a child clinging to your knee and be full of happiness and joy, to write those kinds of stories. I wanted to get there. And it's true, let me just say this frankly and upfront, early feminist writings are can't. Most of my early feminist writings were pitiful. Where well, they weren't pitiful, they were hectoring and lecturing and bombastic and, well, there ain't no other word, pitiful, just pitiful. You wanted somebody to take that child by the neck and say, girl, you know stuff, write the stuff you know, not the stuff you're pretending you know. But to build a writing life, it's a little bit like, like some religions. You have to do a complete and careful, careful moral inventory, not of who you are, but of what you know about people. And the people that you put on the page, even the, even the truly violent, scary ones have got to break your heart on some level. On some level, you have to go back to the thing your mama told you holding her in your arms the two of you looking out into the night and her saying, you're my treasure. You're gonna do stuff, stuff you're gonna do. <laughs> you try to live up to your mama's hope, your mama's expectations. So, Washington DC, Quest, Brooklyn, conditions. I went to Brooklyn, oh, I found a cheap apartment and I had broken up with a girlfriend. You, you know how sometimes you fall in love and sometimes it don't work and leave the city. They used to call that do a geographic. I did a geographic and shifted from Washington DC to Brooklyn. But I had been working as a writer, an editor, a volunteer at various arts organizations. I was working for COSMIC. COSMIC was the committee of small magazine editors and publishers. And it was my people. I mean, it was not a feminist organization and it was not a queer organization, but it was a passionate writer's organization. And we shared stories and we built mailing lists and we, we made friends with bookstores. Oh, long way as I was going through that in Tallahassee, I started a feminist bookstore uh, that lasted 10 years after I left it. Cosmep was my entry into that. And I met, I met writers like me working class writers, men and girls and 
oh, we all love bad poetry. And we all used to recite lines from poetry out loud. And sometimes we would cheat and recite our own poetry and not saying that it was our poetry, hoping somebody would say, oh, isn't that good? Uh, mostly it wasn't good, but it was the enthusiasm and the power. It was almost as if there was a secret America, all writers, all writers, all of us pushing forward, doing the good work. In Brooklyn, I got invited to a meeting of a magazine called Conditions and it changed my life. You can go along writing, you can go along telling your stories, you can talk about your mama, your cousins, your aunts, but I walked into a room to which I had been invited because the staff of the Conditions, which was a literary journal published four issues a year, was replacing itself with four new editors and I was one of the people invited. But I walked into a room in which more than half the people in the room were black. We don't talk enough about coming up white working class, moving into cities where, especially if you're poor and you're living in that neighborhood, you're living among mostly people of color. But walking into that room, I recognized at least one person in the room, Jewel Gomez. I had heard her read poetry at the YWCA. Is that a W? Yes, the women's. And so I knew her and I knew her work, but walking in, I was terrified. These were black women. They were staring at me. I was a white girl, working class white girl. I was terrified. I was ashamed. I was inherently ashamed. You grow up in the South and you've got any kind of politics and any kind of love of journals and magazines and you are ashamed or you I was at that time. Maybe I'm, no, we all were. But we were going, we were invited to be editors together. We were going to have to work together. I was going to have to swallow my fear and my shame and talk to them, to talk about stories, to critique stories. The thing about working as an editor, particularly in a small journal, is that you're going to have to talk personally about what the story says to you and what you think about it. And you are going to say stupid stuff. And someone in the room is going to point out to you that that's pretty dumb, girl. Have you, have you listened to yourself? Jewel was understanding, generous, and highly critical. We became best friends. One of the other editors developed a small habit, a small difficulty with drugs. Both of us tried to intervene. Our friendship deepened. We discovered that we liked the same kind of girls. Hers were mostly brown, mine were mostly pale. And we loved poetry. We could recite Muriel Ruckheiser from heart. Always trust anyone who can recite Muriel Ruckheiser from heart. She would read my stories and say, I don't know about that sentence. Nobody had ever talked to me on the sentence level. I should say, I started winning awards and going to gatherings of writings, put it in quotes, official writings, official writers, real writers, published award-winning writers. And I felt like, I felt like a poor kid at the fair looking at them. Their whole conversations were at a far removed from what I was doing. I could talk about story. I could talk about rhythm and language and meter. I could talk about how you work. You listen to a piece of music and then you use the same rhythm and meter of the music in the sentences that you're putting on the page. I could talk about all that, but I did not read the Paris Review. I had not read all the anthologies that they had read. I didn't even think about writing in terms of applying for all these awards that they were applying for and winning. There was this whole other world, writer's world over there, and that was not my world. I was an indigenous working class troublemaker, writing stories that scared her mama and embarrassed her sisters. And I was working on one of the best journals being published in the country at the time. It was more shocking when I started making friends with some of those writers and they were jealous of me, of the women that I knew 
good writers who would critique my work and talk to me passionately about it, they were sending stuff off to magazines and getting back little rejection notes that said, not for us. When somebody said, not for me, they wouldn't just say, not for me. They'd say, what are you doing in paragraph three? Why did you make her do that? And he don't talk right, does he? They were jealous of me. There is, it is not that there is one writing community. It is that there are many writing communities. You can be invited into some, you gotta worm your way into others and you have to take all of them seriously for what they can teach you. There is one thing we all want to achieve. That thing is to grab hold of the world, to take it by the heart, to pull it into our world, to make our world the world's world. I wish I could tell you a shortcut. Reading the, select, the submissions for the prize this year and reading all those poems and stories and seeing baby writers. I love baby writers. I love the courage and determination of young writers. I love the willingness to be humiliated, pick themselves up and go on. I love the courage of rewriting a story and showing it to people again and again, getting a little better every time. I love the determination of the young writer trying to be good, trying not to shame their mama and their family, except every now and again, shaming your mama is not necessarily a bad idea. Therein lies a lot of recognition of your own foibles. My mama loved everything I ever sent her. And I sent her a lot. In my imagination, she was showing everything that I sent her to my sisters, not my stepfather, nah, but my sisters. When my mama died and my sisters and I went through her drawers, sorting out her clothes, choosing what we would bury her in, I found underneath, underneath her old underwear, all those things I had sent her that I wanted her to show my sisters. They had never seen any of it. She had never shown them. It broke my heart even as I understood. What was she gonna do? Show a mama the story I wrote in trash? Show them the one I wrote about my aunt coming when we were playing pool? Show them the stories I wrote about them? I had the arrogance of the baby writer. She was a mother. She was protecting her younger girls from that older dangerous child she had somehow raised. I was not angry at her, a little heartbroken, but at the same time I understood. So I want to tell you this about the writing life. It will not fix you. It will not fix your family. It will not redeem you. It will not redeem your people, except it will save your life. It will save your family. It will save your people. The stories you tell will make a difference. It is the debt you will repay over and over again. And then you will be invited to West Virginia to come talk. Make out like you're a damn fool, but you don't care. What is that line? I might not have been to the mountaintop, but I've climbed a hell of a lot of foothills. Thank you for inviting me. Bravo, bravo. I wish we had an audience of hundreds here. Bravo, bravo, bravo. I see Heidi Hadrahan there. There are quite a number of names. We've got Karen Zacharias, a uh, wonderful writer also. Dorothy, that was great. Thank you. We, we'll never have another writer that will do the writing life because that's a fixture in, in quite that way. Well, we have a little bit of time uh, in the 10 minutes that we have. If there are, and I'm asking Jody, who probably needs to fix the sidebar over there so that some questions can be asked through the chat room or
Or you can tell me what they are. Or you can, you know, you can also uh, just speak. I'm not sure whether Jody- They're coming can... up on the screen, slowly. Okay. Can you see it then? Because I can't see anything, Dorothy. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there are, um, is this gonna work? I'm afraid to, ah, there they are. Um, Zoom group chat, Jody, Denise, I yeah. think that it is for those that we have, we opened up Zoom and we also opened up as well. So here comes a Andrew. And I've got this is our chat guy, chat. And Andrew is going to do something. Let, let him take a moment to hit chat. Oh, yes. So I've can we move Zoom. it over to the side just a wee bit? Okay. I've got it. Good. Perfect. So you can see those, Dorothy. Take it away. <laughs> Adelie Denise. <laughs> so Karen Spears Zacharias has just written that was stunning, Dorothy. And um, there's a young woman who asked me, How are you doing with the new book? Okay, that's a good question. Have you had the energy and focus to write in the past year or so? God, no. God, no. The world has gone to hell. <laughs> I mean, California has been on fire. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Um, oh, I live in a very small town on a river, and we're used to the river flooding, and we're used to the threat of the flood. Sometimes during flood season, I put on Johnny Cash, you know, five feet high and rising, and all the neighbors laugh. They ain't a song I can put on. I just somehow, I don't want to put on fire songs while the fire is creeping closer. But so right right now, this week, we're good. Um, bad news for the weekend, but we'll get there. It's not able, I'm not able to focus, not for the last few months. And let me just say, I have had to give up news. <laughs> really? I've had to stop watching. I've always been addicted to watching news and watching CNN and all that. And I've had to give it up. Um, I've become hysterical. Yeah. And there well, is, I feel it, so helpless. It's good that you didn't hear the news tonight, as a matter of I fact, heard. coming out of good. Louisville. Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask you a question about that then. Is we've had all these different writers here, and they have different styles as to how they work and this kind of thing. Um, is, is there... Uh, a methodology that you use when you're writing? Are you like an early riser? Do you like to try to write a little bit every day? Do you wait? I mean, uh, Silas House will write in his mind and, you know, he won't sit down to actually put pen to page uh, until it's all worked out here. What's your style? That actually sounds like my friend Ann Patchett. She does the same thing. Yeah. She has to have the whole story in mind before she'll start. Uh, Oh dear. Um, I'm always writing. Um, it isn't always useful. It isn't always good. Um, and I don't, I keep a notebook. I keep a lot of beginnings. When a story starts to shape, it gets on a folder and I start putting all the pieces in. I've got half a novel done that my, both my agent and my editor are crazed about, but then I've got three manuscripts in the barn that they love too, that I just could not make work. Um, it's, it's a hell of a thing to work really, really hard and to find that it either stops or it goes wrong or it goes somewhere you don't know how to make it right. Uh, I'm determined to finish this one and I have invented a bunch of techniques. One of the best techniques, I'm, I'm, I'm my mama's girl, I wake up at, 5.45 every morning, no matter where I am, no matter what time zone I'm in. I wake up at 5.45 in that time zone. Um, and then if I'm smart, I'll get all the stuff I need to get done, all the mail answered, all the bills paid, the dog fed, the cat comforted, some kind of something planned. And then I'll take a nap. Um, and then I'll go lock myself away. But the best work I do, and it is something I've had to accept, the best work I do is middle of the night waking up in the middle of the night with somebody talking in my head and get up and write down what I was hearing and then following it where it goes. So that eventually I build up sections, which is how 
um, I fell into possibly the strangest piece of work I've ever done. <laughs> but everybody that reads it loves it. They'll lie to you, you know. People that love you, they will lie. Um, my girlfriend won't. She's very, very stern and demanding. And she'll say, okay, this is all right. And this is all right from Alex means, okay, you got something. Um, you can't trust editors. They just want a book. <laughs> Even though they might love you, but they want a book. I have a few old writer friends and editors I've worked with, and I'll share work with them when I get it far enough along. I was, I've, been, I've gotten far enough along, but I got to say, everything stopped in August and has been on pause. Um, and packing everything up to run is a big interruption. <laughs> there's, a question, there's a question on uh, on the chat from Karen Zacharias, and, and it is one that I've wondered too. So she asks, how have you been able to, to give your, your mother so much grace? I don't know how you don't understand. Um, I think, I think for a lot of girls like me growing up in that kind of situation, two things. One, she saved my life so many times and in so many ways, and I will never lose track of that. Um, and then there is the hard, hard truth, which is that both I and my sisters lied to her and hid from her what was going on because we loved her so much. And because my mama worked, God, she supported us more often than my stepfather working as a waitress, 12 hour shifts to the point where she had to, oh, terrible things happened to her feet and her back. Working waitress is a killer job, burns all over her arms and hands and never, never a complaint, always just taking care of other people. I gradually figured out that this was not necessarily a good role model for me, but she saved us over and over again. I was never ashamed of her, and I was violently angry at anyone who treated her with contempt, which frankly a lot of people did. You, you are a Southern working class waitress who gave birth at 15. You are not a creature of respect. So she got a lot of that. But anybody who got to know her loved her, and I worshipped her. A lot of things I did, I did to make her proud. Wasn't that hard. She didn't demand a whole lot of me. And, and I suspect the writing itself helped you to understand. I think you figured all this out. I mean, it, I it, think. it, it comes to me in, when I read Cave Dweller that it's a book filled with forgiveness for the mother character. I, I love the way the film did that lovely little touch where uh, Sissy comes and stands behind her mother and then she touches her mother's hair. I thought that was so sweet, so lovely. So your writing gave you some understanding as well, I should think. Yeah. I'm always asked, what are you reading that you think other kids should, other people should read? Um, Interesting. I, I don't know if I told you about the Gang of Four. Um, there are three other women writers that I'm close friends with and we've shared work for years. Uh, Gail Sukiyama, uh, Jane Hamilton, and Karen Joy Fowler. Um, and then there's Ruth, um, Ruth Bateson. There's a lot of other women writers, but there is one particular book that I really encourage young writers to pick up. And since it won a lot of prizes, uh, I recommend it. It's called the, A Tale for the Time Being. Um, which is just an astonishing book. Um, and it's, it does a trick that I think is very useful for young writers particularly. What she does is uh, she writes as herself and she writes as the character. And as herself, she's writing a book. And this is true. My friend has been writing, she's been for years wanting to write a book about um, living on this little island. She and her husband live off the coast up there. Um, and it's, it's Ruth um, Ozeki. And it's, it goes back and forth between the story that she's writing. And in the story that she's writing, she is, you are reading a notebook that is found on the beach by Ruth, the writer. 
and the notebook on the beach is wrapped all in plastic and comes sweeping in after the tsunami in Japan. And it tells you the story of what you suspect is someone who survived the tsunami, but you don't know for sure when you're reading it. So it goes back and forth from Ruth, the writer, trying to, to interview her mother and write about Alzheimer's to the young Japanese girl in this notebook. And it goes back and forth. It's glorious, gorgeous writing, but complicated that you cut from a real life to an imaginary life. I think it's a great text for young writers to read to see how you do that. Because the, the Ruth in the book is Ruth. It's Ruth with her and her husband and their environmental activists. And they do live on an island off the coast of Seattle. And they, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a witness of how you could do it if you were as good a writer as Ruth is. <laughs> we have time for one more question, and and we're going to give Heidi Hanningham the last word because Heidi just gave. Oh, up. Heidi, you were so wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> she was, and I don't know. Can you read her question? Can you see that on the screen? Uh, she just, you know, she just answered my question. She did. Okay, great. Yeah. Good. So, good. yeah. Thank you. I think that that is. That is a great way to end this. I mean, Dorothy, this was a splendid, splendid evening, a wonderful uh, opportunity to really gain some insight into the writer's life. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome, darling. And uh, we appreciate everybody coming out tomorrow, three o'clock. We have um, the writer's masterclass. That is a really, really interesting, a different approach to the writer's life. And uh, the focus is on young writers or baby writers, as Dorothy calls them. And then tomorrow night, the Scarborough Lecture. So join us then, 3 o'clock and 8 o'clock tomorrow. And uh, this has just been a great evening. And we want to thank again Eric Wagner for coming in on this and for fully funding us, which was <laughs> really quite a joy. So I, I give Dorothy Allison full credit for that fully funding. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And uh, stay safe. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you. That's great.